Hello, um, hope everyone can hear me. Uh, good morning, good afternoon and evening, depending on where you all are joining us from. Uh, my name is Naomi Nash. I'm going to be your host for the next hour as we discuss the topic of building ecosystem trust and collaboration for digital transformation. I've been helping the ecosystem in the city of Birmingham um, and the surrounding areas in the UK for about six or seven years now. I'm very passionate about and I, I truly believe in the power of communities and ecosystems, but they don't always happen naturally and they require a lot of work and a lot of collaboration. I'm really pleased to be joined by some awesome people from all over the world to talk you through their experience and give you some top tips. So first up, if we can give, get, get a wave as I, as, I, uh, as I introduce you, we have Julia Traverso, who is the principal uh, cryptographer at SciSec, a cybersecurity startup where she is responsible for innovation, project funding, patents and research. Hi, Julia. We hi. also have, hi, we also have uh, Marius Stanchu, who's a lawyer and a blockchain enthusiast, can talk to us about uh, some of that a bit later. We hello, have, hello. Hi, Marius. Um, let me just see if I can change that. There we go. I can see everyone now. Um, we have Cesar Contreras. Um, focus, uh, so Cesar focuses on identifying new technologies for Ministry of Communications and Transport of Mexico. Um, we have Pumza Diani, who is the founder of Pan African Network for Investment and Development and a partner for the, uh, in the South, Southern African region for the Regional Consortium of Experts for Development. Hi, and thank you for joining us. And last but not least, we have Henry Dobson, who's the founding director of the Institute of Technological Ethics, a very important topic that I'm looking forward to getting into. So hello and thank you all for joining me today from quite literally all over the world. It's very exciting. Um, so just about this topic, we all know um, many collaboration initiatives can be ineffective because they are developed in silos uh, without an overall understanding of how ecosystem stakeholders can um, collaborate to deliver our national development priorities. Ecosystem stakeholders, so we're talking about public sector, academia, professional services, the entrepreneurial support organisations, as well as the private sector, need to be aligned to support innovators and entrepreneurs on their journey in the ever-changing environment. So this ITU Global Innovation Forum 2020 session will provide insights on how we can build a culture of trust and collaboration. So without further ado, let's get started. And uh, as, as I come to each of you in turn, it'd be great if you could just say where, where you are currently in the world and maybe what time it is. It's just turned one o'clock in the afternoon here in the UK. I have no idea what time it is where you guys are. Um, so Marius, if I could just come to you first. Um, it'd be great if you could just explain uh, your, your experience with building trust and collaboration between the different stakeholders I just mentioned. Yeah, so first of all, I'm in Bucharest, Romania. It's 3 p.m. So I'm, 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 I'm having a good hour to say so. Uh, to answer your question and to try to be brief, as a lawyer, uh, you tend to work a lot with legislation that is adopted without uh, consulting the business environment or the people that are directly impacted by it. It's not uncommon to see laws which sound very good on paper, but in basically in real life, they're not applicable. So why does this happen? I think it comes from the fact that lawmakers, when they are writing laws, they're not thinking about stakeholders. They are writing laws without getting feedback from the relevant industry. Uh, a good example of this is the, are the attempts to regulate new technologies such as distributed ledger technology with blockchain as its main star, artificial intelligence and so on. Who do you bring on the table to write about such a topic? Do you bring tech people as it is usually done or do you bring consultants, lawyers, hedge fund managers? Why is it so important to bring all of them? Um, as an example, at some point I was involved in Romania in drafting the, the first piece of legislation on distributed ledger such as blockchain. And uh, I remember that in the, in the first day we were literally arguing about things like what is a ledger? What does distributed mean? We were shocked to see that lawyers and tech people see an, el an electronic contract very differently. And it was quite frustrating because uh, we had the feeling that we are arguing about these basic notions when we should 
get down to the real stuff, the most complex one. Come on, let's talk about blockchain, the things that, that are hot right now. But I think that this uh, time consuming process, maybe it's the only way through which you can come with something that is applicable to real life. Uh, it's easy to see stakeholders which are pursuing the same thing. Uh, as a lawyer, for example, it's not uncommon to see in a, in a negotiation persons with the same interest, but because they're not really listening to the other party, they think the other party has a, a different interest from them. And they are, okay, I'm not listening to you. You want something from me? No, no, this is not gonna happen. So in order to build bridge be between stakeholders to say so, as simple as, as this may seem, from my perspective, you should establish a framework. Let's be clear on what we're talking about because you might be surprised that we are talking about this the same thing, but just using different words. So yeah, I think it's that simple. Thank you, thank you for that. You say simple, but I think I have the same problem with my husband. <laughs> 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 but no, I completely agree with you. That's really great insight, thank you. Um, so Cesar, from your experience, um, would you what would you say is the best way to kind of foster collaboration across relevant stakes? A similar question, I suppose. Thank you very much, Naomi. Uh, um, first of all, I'm based in Mexico City. So it's 7.14 a.m. Still pretty early for us over here. <laughs> so uh, uh, answering the question, I would say that uh, as uh, the creator of a project or idea, it is essential to engage all uh, stakeholders. First, individually, I would say, to uh, build rapport. Uh, so we, let's say, open the channel for communication with, with each of them individually, instead of uh, addressing, uh, 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 let's, say, let's say, all of them uh, since the beginning uh, in, in bulk. So uh, we, we think that is very important to identify those uh, different stakeholders and to try, and to, try to, to develop that relationship with them. Uh, it is fundamental to listen to all of them, to hear what they have to say and to understand what their incentives are, uh, what their motivations are, and what you know, even the fears uh, are for them. So uh, it is, it is uh, for us very relevant here in Mexico, we have organized a set of uh, roundtables to discuss with different actors uh, what, what would be good, 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 uh, a good way for them to approach and to, to take a step forward regarding innovation. So that would involve first an approach with each of them and, and then you, to, to sit them at the table to, to get the, this discussion going. And as an enabler of the technology um, and innovation change, uh, it is very important to build something that harmonizes, and this is the real challenge, I would say, something that uh, harmonizes uh, uh, the, the incentives, the motivations, and everything that you, uh, let's say, received in this, in this previous phase. Uh, to actually lead other uh, stakeholders to take the necessary steps to implement the idea. So this would be a way of, of saying, you know, first you have to identify who they are and to uh, uh, work with them one-to-one, uh, -one. then uh, set, set them at the table, sit them and, and, and have, make them have the conversation, and then to identify as you as the enabler of, of the change what the things would be necessary uh, to get from, from, from all the different actors, what each, each actor could put on the table and offer to actually make this collaboration happen. So, so I'll, I'll say that, thanks. Thank you, yeah, I think it's, uh, I completely agree with you. We try and um, do that, so I work for Tech Nation and that's kind of what we try to do across the UK. Um, can always let be tough, I know it can, uh, trying to listen to uh, everybody's opinions and what they think is the is the priority at the time. So, but I, I agree, very, very important. Thank you. Um, so, uh, Bunzo, if I can come to you next. Um, your resume is pretty impressive, I must say. <laughs> um, and I'm sure you have lots of uh, experience. So what would you, what kind of advice would you have regarding um, the adoption of new technologies for the communities they're being developed for? Uh, thank you very much, and thanks for inviting me to be a participant in today's session. So from my side, I think I'm here representing communities because as much as we map them, when we map the stakeholders, we tend to leave them behind or we leave them towards the end when the technology is ready and it is ready for adoption and implementation. And I think that's where we miss the plot in, in most of these things. What becomes important in involving communities is that 
I, I think I loved what um, my previous speaker spoke about, where we say we need to elevate them to a level of being co-creators of the innovation. You must remember that they are part of the social construct and they get to see most of the social problems that are being experienced. And they would be in a position to really add more value, a lot more value in how we orchestrate solutions for solving their problems. So we would uh, develop problems, uh, sorry, we, we do develop solutions, but mostly who is around the table is the innovator. It's the, it's the ecosystems of the academic, it's the private sector, it's the public sector, but we never call them to the table to say, when we localize the innovation, what is important for you from a cultural fit perspective, from a value add perspective? So the other factors I'd like to add is that also it's around the value statement. So when you bring them up front into the de development of the innovation, they get to understand the value of the innovation. You get to have the communities as the protectors of the innovation, because most of the innovation is dependent on infrastructure that we lay out. So when, once you get their lobbying and their buy-in upfront, you get them to be the protectors as well as the advisors on how do we build the ecosystems even further. You also find that from an innovator's perspective, we have, tend to have a single mind of saying, okay, we're solving an agriculture issue, we're solving this issue. But inclusion of communities actually adds value to how we scale the innovations because they know what's on the ground and what could also be resolved by the innovation we're putting on the ground. So I, 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 would, I would say their involvement is important because you find that half the time we invested in the infrastructure, we invested in the innovation, but they end up being white elephants because you have not really lobbied for their involvement upfront and it becomes a ribbon cutting event but we don't get to accelerate or leverage the benefit of the innovation on the ground. So including them upfront is empowerment. Firstly, you teach them how to use the technology. They then also, because they have the foundation, they use the principles to also solve other problems. So there's an empowerment aspect. And I'd like to maybe refer to one of the innovations that have really worked in my environment where we've deployed an internet in a, in a community where we made the communities participants in how we deploy the infrastructure, in how we formed commercial models around the, 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 the infrastructure. Because what we also tend to think we know is we tend to also think that we, are, we know uh, the affordability of the people on the ground. The most creative commercial models came from the com communities. And what also that added benefit for is that even when the funding is available to help them, there is sustainability because then they come up with creative commercial models of how we sustain the innovation and the infrastructure that is on the ground. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's a really good um, good point to ensure that we are um, getting them involved sooner. I think maybe one of the reasons we don't is because we worry about there being delays. Um, mm -hmm. But I think um, going back to what Cesar was saying as well about you know, having these conversations as early as we can is, is vital. So thank you for that for that insight. Um, Henry, if I can come to you now. Um, so ethics within technology is a very important subject, doesn't get talked about very much. Um, there's a, I don't know if it's available everywhere yet, but on Netflix, there's um, a really good documentary about the ethics around some of the social media, which I highly recommend. Um, so how, how, how can we build ethics into the technology that, we're, that we develop and why should we? Yeah, thank you, Naomi. And it's uh, great to be here with you all. I'm calling in from Australia uh, and it's about 20 past 12 uh, in the morning. So uh, nice and early. <laughs> and um, yeah, you, you, you're right uh, to point out the new documentary on Netflix called The Social Dilemma. It is well worth watching um, because it does raise some very uh, sort of dark sides around social media and, uh, and big tech. But to answer your question, um, the, the starting point here really has to be human values. And there are two, so steps, two sides to this. Um, first, uh, as the other um, participants have mentioned, and I'd like to echo all, the, all of their points because they're, they're, they're excellent and, and very valid and important for, um, uh, for building ethics into, into technology and innovation. But um, the two sides really are, uh, the, the human values of society or the social values and then the values that uh, the technology companies or, or tech 
based entities um, have themselves. So the starting point there really is to look at the values, um, either the, the business values or the company values, um, and to compare those with, with social values. And I think one of the major problems we're seeing with technology today is that there is a divergence between the values that technology companies have. Now, of course, you know, one of their sort of primary objectives is, is profit. Um, but of course, that doesn't always necessarily result in uh, the ideal outcome for society. And so you do get um, divisions or tensions at least uh, between what technology is doing and, and what uh, the impacts are on, on broader society and, and human life. Um, so, so values are, are, are absolutely fundamental and, um, and we need these conversations. We have to understand um, you, what is it that we really do value as human beings? And then, of course, there are different contexts around that. Of course, cultural contexts. There are different, um, of course, different regions of the world, different histories, different religions, uh, and just just general different interests depending on where we live. And all of these uh, sort of ultimately constitute our, our own human values, both as individuals and as and as members of society. So uh, you know, values are, are essential um, for, for making technology more ethical, um, but then there are other ways to build ethics into technology. Um, I mean, these are sort of buzzwords, but you know, diversity and inclusion, and they get thrown around a lot, but they are absolutely fundamental, again, uh, because it, especially with diversity, um, but equally, of course, inclusion, you, they are primary mechanisms for understanding uh, how subconscious bias can creep into the technology design or be it the management and deployment of a, of a technology product um, and the more the more minds you have overseeing those technology products and and, and the broader uh, sort of impacts beyond just the, the business setting itself um, will will keep you know good oversight hopefully on on how that technology is serving society so diverse diversion uh, sorry diversity and inclusion are essential but um equally again uh, you're running auditing um auditing processes over uh, technology products uh, especially the algorithms and ensuring that we do have a sufficient transparency for understanding the outcomes and the way that any any outcome is influencing the human decision making process after the output is made um, because of course you can you can um, compound bias and discrimination if you know if the management are using what are already biased outputs um, from from big data and, and algorithmic um, bias so um, so transparency is uh, critical in that respect um, and then also thinking about uh, and trying to preempt the the consequences uh, that any technology product um, may or could have on society before it's deployed. Uh, so, you know, consequential risk analysis is a, a, a key piece of, um, you know, good ethical management for any technology company or any uh, entity with you know, a stakeholder of any kind. It could be a government, it could be, um, you know, a, just a, a corporation um, or even, uh, you know, other sort of just other ways in which we, we, we leverage Facebook and social media for, you know, achieving particular uh, purposes or, or, or aims. So, yeah, um, you know, consequential, uh, consequential sort of analysis is, is essential too for making, you know, the, the best out of our technology. Brilliant. Thank you very much. I think it's really, it's really interesting, especially if we're We've been talking about getting people involved in those decision making a lot earlier than we maybe are currently um, and just having someone in the room if, if, if you're listening that could be you to say well what's the consequence of this it's really it's a great shout thank you very much um uh, last but no means least uh julia if i can come to you now um so i'd love to speak uh with you about cyber security and um how historically if we think about it we're thinking about how that how we use it to protect ourselves um, from others. Uh, but if we're talking about collaboration and communities, um, 
what what would you say about is it possible to use use it instead to enable that trust hi uh, first of all i am calling from switzerland and here is almost 2 30 uh, in the afternoon so yeah you're right so my main job, my main topic, like I, I, my work is basically focusing on cryptography and cybersecurity. And nowadays we are seeing that more and more it is cryptography in particular that is enabling all these collaborations that then foster innovation that we were talking about. So for example, everyone is talking about AI to as a mean to boost innovation. But for example, what we see is that for, for example, very small startups that they are coming with a great idea to leverage AI and then, you know, for example, improve uh, digital agronomy and having it less polluting for the environment, etc. Like what they actually lacking of is the data, it's like the raw data on, on which then AI uh, can run on. And the, the people that usually have collected the data are either big companies already or the government but of course those are for example um protected protected under the gdpr or are simply business core information that companies not necessarily don't don't want, want to 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 outsource from their from their premise and so what happens and like here is basically like a, an optimistic example that i provide so that uh, we are not just talking about what is possible what it, like what will be possible is actually happening right now is that by specific and innovative uh, uh, cryptographic algorithms that enable to protect the data but still to run uh, computations on them like uh, uh, government can trust those as sme they can basically lend like give them for a while their their data just so for the training to happen and then what the the company the, like the small startup for example will get is just the result like the end up result of that algorithms while the raw data will not will ever be disclosed because of course like this might happen to be uh, data related to people and therefore uh, protected under the gdpr besides this type of uh, of, of of solution there are others so everybody is still talking about big data again and big data to for example cure cancer or like improve uh, the medical treatment of patients but again uh, for example the, the the number of patients that are treated for a certain disease in one hospital is not sufficient to basically basically allow a phd student in uh, in the medical field to, to have enough data again to process and to write the, the, the thesis on. And the bottleneck often of those PhD studies is the fact that other hospitals from other countries will again not, not, not give the, the data. And again, uh, there's other cryptographic means and cybersecurity that allow to store all all the data in a distributed manner in a, in a cloud environment and to run this, uh, this computation even without leaving the premise, for example. So everybody has their intermediate result of their um, uh, in uh, artificial intelligence algorithm that will be landed to, to the PhD student and then this will draw the thesis and eventually hopefully improve a certain treatment of patients. So yeah, basically my perspective on this is about what, uh, with, thanks to cybersecurity and in particular cryptography, we are already able to do. And I think that, uh, yeah, cybersecurity, as you said, is there to protect you against, you know, a malicious attacker, but in this case, enables people that are willing to collaborate to do that uh, while still being compliant with the GDPR and protecting their patients. And I think this is great. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, I think you're right. I think, I think there's a lack of education in the general public um, kind of around this. We get the scare tactics like from Netflix and from the media, um, but actually there's, there's so much good that can be done from, from big data. Um, on big data, uh, I'm going to come back to you, Marius, to talk about blockchain a little bit, a little bit more. I know you mentioned it previously. Um, could you just explain really quickly um, for people that are watching the, the premise behind what blockchain is and um, talk about how you would suggest uh, good ways to foster the adoption of the regulations that come alongside these, these new technologies, so not just the technologies themselves, but the, the legal uh, regulations. 
Well, I think that's that's the issue here because I liked what Pumza said earlier. Uh, I, I'll go forward a bit. How do you adopt regulations on topics like this? You involve communities. Uh, you see a lot of pe pe people talking about blockchain, um, machine learning, all this stuff, but and the countries that are trying to come with draft legislation or reports, but trying to to read them, it's so it's almost impossible if you don't have a technical background. And I don't have; I'm a lawyer. Uh, I need someone to basically translate to me what are they saying. Uh, I mean, I would be happy to to think that I'm able to explain blockchain so simple. I'm trying to explain it to my mother for a year, and I'm not so successful. So I'm not sure I'll be able to do this in this conference. But basically, it's a distributed ledger technologies which. Uh, eliminate a single central unit that collects data. Data is collected on each of the ledger. It's like an Excel file, which each cell having piece, the same piece of information. Uh, what can we do to regulate this thing better? I mean, we have an example, or it's the start of an example in Malta, which has become like a crypto heaven, if you want. But uh, before adopting that legislation, they consulted hedge fund managers, lawyers, business consultants, and so on. And at some point I had a client who was interested in investing uh, in an ICO. So he was interested in Malta. And he told me that for the first time in his life, he was able to read the law and understand something from it. Okay, he did not understand everything, but he was able to understood, understand something. And I think that's the key to be able to explain to ordinary men or ordinary people, what are we talking about? Because we are always talking about blockchain and this complicated technology, but we're not thinking about the relevant stakeholder, normal people, because in order for a law to be implemented, it has to be understood by the normal person. It, it You cannot just say, okay, the tech, the tech people got it, so it's fine, we'll just go to them. Because as we saw, uh, you mentioned the social dilemma. At some point in that documentary, it was said that the uh, a person who was in, being interviewed said that in Google, he thinks that there are maybe three persons who really understand what they're doing from A to Z. And, and that's a problem. And that's a problem with law also, because we're, we're regulating so complex and so specialized that after a point, nobody, nobody gets the point. So in order to have clear, clear laws, from my perspective, put different people with different backgrounds in the same room, let them argue in a controlled manner, and after a few days, you'll have a good law. Don't do that. And I don't know, maybe you'll have a law that sounds very fancy or very good on paper, but probably won't be very applicable to real life or to the ordinary people on the, on the street. Yeah, thank you. It kind of goes it goes back to what we were saying about those those kind of social and human values, um, and to, and making sure that they're part of the conversation early yeah. on um, to help with the legislation. So thank you for that. Um, so if I can come to you uh, just now, uh, we we know that the, the kind of the big cities, the big countries, um, are have have better um chance of implementing um uh, technologies they've got the infrastructure um but could you tell us some experience about maybe about the, the more rural communities and how how we can support um the digital transformation there mm -hmm. so thank you very much for that question i realize i did not tell you where i'm, I'm from and what time of the day it is is it it's a uh, 3:35 and I am based in South Africa, apologies for that. So uh, it's, it's a very interesting one. And I think one is, that has been a fulfilling experience in my career in ICT, because what it means is we talk about the digital divide, but we don't know how extreme it is. So in the communities that we roll out the, we roll out the, the, the infrastructure to is where there's still an excitement when uh, uh, maybe a, a learner switches on the internet for the first time. And the first thing that they go to is to go to um, sourcing bursaries or going to maybe um, universities to apply for, you know, for ter tertiary education. It's very fulfilling because you walk away from those with a set of fulfillment and achievements that you've actually changed the trajectory of someone's life 
forever. You've exposed them to something that they will never be exposed to. So I think part of what I bring as, an, as, a, as, a, as a conversation to the table is exactly that, that we cannot count on the old mechanism of transformation where we will wait now another 15 years before we introduce them to AI before we introduce them to blockchain and, and all of those things, because we're talking about inclusion. So inclusion is not going to take the form of what we said inclusion was, it has not worked. We still have communities that are not included. So I think that that's why I, I am an advocate of upfront involvement, upfront engagement of, of communities. And the, the technology may be the divide, but the social IQ, the social IP is there for solving uh, solutions. So it is a very important work that we're doing, but let's not make the mistake again of talking about so social inclusion, but we don't act it. Thank you very much. Thank you, that's that's very, very uh, interesting to, to hear about that. Again, we do talk about inclusion and we, we tend to focus on certain areas, but forget, forget others exactly as you've just said. Um, I love that. I love that kind of fulfilling, you know, and really having that, make, making that difference to these to these communities. It's, it's lovely. Um, Cesar, just coming to you uh, next. Um, are there governance models uh, and principles um, to accelerate collaboration and trust, would you say? Thank you, Naomi. Uh... Yes, well, definitely, uh, we have been uh, trying to understand, have a better understanding of how this uh, collaboration could be fostered in the most uh, possible efficient uh, uh, way. Uh, and uh, in, the, in the Mexican ecosystem, I'd like to refer to an idea that we have been implementing, we have, de we have been developing since uh, uh, last year, which is uh, something that uh, my colleagues and I see some familiar faces over here uh, know already about uh, because this is uh, uh, an idea that we have been uh, pushing for since uh, 2019 and this is called the Observatory of Digital Technologies and Public Policy Trends and for us this is this is this is a project that will help us to understand uh, what what are the best practices uh, re regarding collaboration and, and technology uh, implementation and development technological development overall uh, and this is this is uh, an effort uh, to understand what the, the best practices are. So uh, we, we would also tropicalize them and implement them in the Mexican ecosystem. Uh, to create this, this project, we have been uh, working with, with, uh, with the community in the design, which will launch in 2019, as I said. Uh, start with uh, thematic discussion tables that we had in May 2019 to get a better understanding of how this project would fit into the, the already existing and, 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 and you know, the, the several, the wide array of partners out there interested in technological development. Uh, we, we, we launch uh, questionnaires uh, with, with different actors uh, to get an understanding and let's say uh, walk the talk, you know, regarding what, what I was saying about listening to them and hearing what they have to say in terms of, of their motivations and their interests, et cetera. Uh, with, with that, with those inputs, we created uh, the first draft of the models, uh, namely the general aspects of, of the project and also the operational aspects, financial aspect and governance aspect as well. And we conducted roundtables uh, in December with uh, 350 participants registered over the course of three days. And after that, you know, the, the, the work of harmonizing the different inputs that we received from them was a very challenging task because we were receiving, you know, very specific feedback and guidance from, let's say, lawyers, as, as Marius was saying, and we were receiving a very, if not, I wouldn't say opposite, but, uh, you know, very, very uh, hard to put together, uh, let's say, guidance from, from, uh, from technical people. So we were trying to sort everything out to make it, uh, to, to you know, not end up with a Frankenstein, but something that it actually works to promote this this collaboration. So that was that was a tough task. But uh, in March we were able to have, uh, you know, the, let's say the preliminary versions of the models, and we were, we submitted that to a public consultation in uh, from March to July, which was extended uh, because of the COVID pandemic, and the final models were finalized in September 2020. So uh, I have to say that uh, right now we are uh, analyzing the, the next, the course of, of, of implementation. 
uh, and the course of action to be taken to actually, you know, keep the ball rolling regarding this project. Uh, so far, many different actors in the, in the Mexican ecosystem, you know, very high level firms and companies uh, have uh, uh, raised their hands, you know, to say, I'm interested in this project and I would like to, to, to stay, uh, uh, you know, stay abreast of the different best practices out there. So uh, to implement this, we are uh, pushing for the, the creation of working groups to analyze the most pressing issues like technology for COVID or 5G deployment, et cetera, et cetera. And these uh, different groups, uh, our aim is for them to uh, insert naturally in the observatory once it's up and running. So I'll leave you there and, uh, and, and thanks uh, for, for, the, for the spaces as well. Thank you. It's so interesting to hear how different countries are working on some of the problems. I'm actually quite loving how we're all on the same page, even though we've obviously all got very different um, experiences um, of life. So thank you for that. Um, Henry, I'm just going to come back over to you. I'm feeling for you of how late it is. I'm, I'm surprised you're still awake. So thank you for staying with us. Um, so what what good practice have you have you seen in in in, uh, in Australia um, and the ecosystem there that that has is working towards building the trust um, with the stakeholders? So the, well, I mean, there, there are all sorts of um, practices going on, of course, in, in globally, um, as Caesar was just pointing out. And um, I mean, what is wonderful, I think, uh, just, just generally, is that there is now a lot of um, momentum uh, behind the importance of, um, community collaboration and um and innovation that that's not you know just just tech focused it, it really is becoming um sort of human you know very much a human focused um sort of program and project and you know as, as a result of that there um i mean the one thing i'm most familiar with and and what i think is is great to see is that there are um between 80 and 90 uh, different um, public-private initiatives right around the world, uh, each of which have developed their own ethical frameworks and their own sort of code of ethics uh, and, and visions for how they see, um, whether it be AI or um, IoT or, or just, uh, you know, technology in general. And, of course, that th those frameworks are... Um, specifying particular principles such as transparency around algorithmic design, um, privacy, <clears throat> safety and security for um, autonomous vehicles on the road. And uh, so, you know, th there's a huge amount of work going on at the moment um, with these frameworks, which, which I think is you know, a, a very positive sign that, you know, we are beginning to think ethically and, and we are, beginning to build, uh, you know, our, our sort of humanity into, you know, our technology and our ecosystems. Um, but that's, uh, that, that, that's not to say that it's, it's awfully problematic at the same time, because, uh, you know, one of the, the initial problems with so many of these initiatives is that um, there's quite a high degree of pluralism, you know, between these frameworks. So um, what's, very interesting to look into and to investigate as I'm doing is uh, the commonalities amongst these different frameworks and um, there's sort of an essential there's a there's an, an essential sort of humanity behind, you know in, in a lot of them whilst there's a diversity of different values and and um, perspectives on on how you know technology should be good um, there's also, yeah, a lot of a lot of common ground as well, which which I think is another another reason to be very optimistic about the way that technology is evolving. Um, but equally here in Australia, you know, we we the the government released uh, its own ethical framework. I think back in uh, back in June or July, um, as have done you know a lot of governments around the world have, have recently um, released their you know their own respective frameworks. So. Um, so yeah, you know, we, we, are we are doing sort of, you know, what a lot of other, uh, countries and a lot of other organizations, um, such as, you know, the, the Montreal, uh, declaration for responsible AI. And, uh, there's also the AI for people initiative in, in Europe. And I mean, there's a, yeah, again, a huge number of them. 
Um, so yeah, I think this is one of the, the most positive signs um, from, from my own perspective that you know, we are moving in the right direction, um, but there's still a lot of work to be done. Yeah, I couldn't, couldn't agree more with you on that one. Um, so yeah, thank you for that. It's really interesting to hear what, what's going on on the, on the other side of the world. Um, just looking at time. Okay, we've still got a little bit. Um, so Julia, coming over to you um, now. Thank you for, thanks for waiting. Um, so we, we've also been talking about um, communities and stakeholders, um, just uh, to help our audience maybe a little bit. Uh, what, who would you say would kind of the, the most vital stakeholders that we want to be having in our, in our conversations? Um, and if, from your experience, have you seen a, a common um, or recurring challenges um, when involving these stakeholders, um, or is it much kind of dependent on the conversation? Well, I speak from the perspective of a company that is a cybersecurity provider. So what we have seen is that for sure, the stakeholders involved even indirectly are the big tech companies, those that are really doing the technology. So for example, uh, you want to you want to have uh, AI uh, over satellite pictures. Well, at the end of the day, you will never be able to talk to a satellite, but you will go through Google Earth engine. So it, it, it doesn't matter. Like Google is involved as a technology provider, and then there's the the stakeholders having the data, for example, collecting the personal data like the government or like other companies like insurance or banks, it really depends on the use case in this. In this. Um, the other stakeholders are uh, the, the, the other companies that are willing to really use this, leverage this data and leverage uh, this technology to advance in a certain way innovation in a more inclusive way since we are talking about uh, how to advance community and at least in my perspective there is the cyber security provider so the person who is really um, the person or the stakeholder that is really in charge of connecting all these dots while taking responsibility for being compliant with certain regulations. And so in, in a way, there's also indirectly, like for the big tech company, there's also the government. So this, and, and of course, like the challenge here is, uh, as it was already said in the panel, I am dealing with uh, the fact that I need to go through regulations and I don't really understand and I need somebody some lawyers to help me, but on the other hand, they don't know nothing about security. They don't know how AI is really, you know, set up. And so this is basically the difficulty to really provide a, a, a cohesive and coherent solution for that. This is, yeah, at least in my experience, but it seems that it, it is the experience of everyone here in the panel. Yeah. No, I, th I think you're right. I think everyone, we just need to talk more, right? It's good to talk. Everyone just needs to talk. Everyone just needs to talk. But actually, I think that this should, like, I, I don't think this is just a matter of talking. This is really something that should start way earlier uh, at university. I had no idea that with the studies that I was um, doing, I would have needed to, to have some low, you know, to, to, to need to be able to speak that language. Same thing, lawyers don't take at university, they don't know what, what a digital signature is or a blockchain is. And I have a very good friend of mine who, who is a lawyer, and then in a, like a post doctoral master, whatever in Brussels from Italy, which is my country of origin, she was, you know, uh, given like a two hour introduction to technology. Uh, do you think that with two hours technology, she, she is now able to help, I don't know, technology SMEs or, or startups or something? No, absolutely not. So yeah, we need to talk, but we need to be ready to talk. And like, we need to have the education that, that enables to have effective communication. Otherwise, this is going nowhere. Yeah, I love that. I love that. I definitely think the uh, well, uh, the British school system definitely needs an update. I'll give you that. But uh, yeah, the, 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 the things that we're teaching the kids who are growing up in this digital age, 
surely they need to be learning different things to to what to what um, generations before have. It's a really good point. Thank you. Um, we've got a couple of questions um, from the audience. So let's go first. I'll open this up to, to all of you. Um, so question one, uh, what is the biggest challenge you have encountered to get stakeholders to collaborate to build a healthy innovation system? So that's what we talk. That's basically what we've been talking about is, is, is getting people to talk. But has anyone got a great example of of how that's been difficult and how you've managed to overcome it or still haven't been able to overcome it? Let me give it a step. Eh? I think um, it's, a, it's a double edged sword in the same token of saying engage communities that you also find them to be also the greatest resistors at times of technology and of innovation, purely from a perspective of fear of not understanding what is being introduced. So I think what we've learned is that it needs to be a continuous in engagement because you are literally taking someone from a stage of not understanding the maybe the foundational aspects and we've been privy to at least see how innovation has been evolving. So as much as we push for community engagement, we just need to know it doesn't come without pain and, and, and just, you know, continuous engagement and continuous articulation. That's great, thank you. Um, we, we have some, um, I don't know what um, you call it in other parts of the world, but we, we call it big egos and people uh, are not necessarily willing to listen to other people's perspectives and it can really hold, it can really put a, a halt in, in things and they either, it either stops the innovation from happening or it delays it or that person has to get pushed out somehow, which is, is not always great. So um, yeah, I hope everybody listening will kind of have a bit more of an open open ideas, uh, open ears to listen to. Um, anybody else want to stab at that one? Uh, I, I would like to share uh, something that happened, Naomi, if, if I may. Uh, when when the, this uh, round tables and discussion tables that I referred to in my previous intervention happened, uh, we had uh, a very interesting experience with, with uh, actors from the industry because they would say, okay, no, you know, I, I cannot sit with them. I cannot speak with them because, you know, we're competitors and we don't speak to each other. And I was like, well, that's a problem to begin with. You know, the, the thing is that you are not uh, collaborating with each other and you have to see yourselves as actors interested in development, interested in technology, not as competitors. Com competition comes after this. You know, this is, the, this is the foundation of technological development, collaboration. So this is something that really launches into thinking that, you know, the project that I talked to you about would really make a, make a difference in the ecosystem by actually sitting actors and aligning their, their interests and making them aware of the need to collaborate. Thank you. Yeah, we, people that refuse to talk to other people. I had um, a couple of um, companies I was supporting. They both claim to have the own the IP of the technology that they were using in two different companies. So yeah, that was that was a fun one to try and untangle. Um, should I come back to you, Caesar? Should another question come in? Um, is the Mexico Innovation Observatory information available online? Yes, it will become available. Uh, we are currently working on the design of the platform because we're uh, thinking of different audiences. Uh, uh, the observatory is going to help uh, regular uh, citizens interested in technological development uh, up to, uh, let's say, technology developers, academia, research, et cetera. So this is going to be based on, a, on, a, on an internet uh, available platform. And the model itself, we, we have thought since the beginning that it should be something that could be replicated in other countries as well. So we would be, I mean, more than, 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 than trying to provide uh, findings for the Mexican ecosystem to other actors abroad, we would like to, to think of, of, of a model that, you know, if, if, if it results in, in everything that we expected to result considering what we were seeing in terms of, 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 of making progress for, for the Mexican ecosystem regarding innovation and technological development, we will be very happy to discuss with, discuss with other countries how to, how to uh, tropicalize the model for, for their own use as well. Brilliant, there we go, call to action. Thank you for that. Um, uh, Julia, I'm going to come to you for this question. So um, apparently Global Innovation Forum is crushing the internet because there's so many people wanting to collaborate. I guess this is um, coming back, well, it's a little bit to do with maybe the, the rural infrastructure we were talking about and, and the accessibility, but 
um, if we want to talk about uh, cross cross country um, collaborations and more people getting involved in the conversation, um, how can we? How much work do you know of that's going into solving the the kind of the infrastructure problem that we we haven't quite got the big enough or capable enough infrastructure yet to do maybe what we want to do? Well, for sure. Uh, am I mute? Yeah, I'm not. I'm not muted. Okay. Well, for sure. Uh, the way I see it is that the cloud is the biggest enabler now of uh, of innovation in the sense that now people can afford to really have an IT infrastructure. But what 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 is crucial here to to really to really highlight is the fact that even in Europe, we are far behind the US. So the cloud is basically something that the US has invented and, and produced. And uh, I was talking to the CTO of a very big tech company in France uh, a couple of weeks ago, and he too was in the opinion that we in Europe are really, really behind that. So, and like, and we are in Europe. So like, you know, we have the internet. It's not that we got access uh, a couple of days ago and we could, you know, enroll to, to university and we have 5G, etc. Uh, I don't have an answer to, to such a question, actually. I mean, yeah, so this is not a very, a very optimistic uh, thing, but yeah, like, uh, I... Yeah, like it will be like really huge in, in investments on, on a cloud infrastructure. Like again, uh, the collaboration on on, on an infrastructure that uh, people can share in a multi-tenancy matter, because this will lower the cost. Because otherwise, there's too much big of cost at the entry level, and then the, the small players will, will just not cannot afford so uh, at least for Europe, like uh, yeah, according to some experts, we are far behind the US. But uh, one thing that we could do, at least on our side, is to really encourage companies not to use Azure or AWS or the Google Cloud, but to really try to go even like the Deutsche Telekom Cloud or things like that in Germany, for example, to, to really, uh, I'm not saying pouring money, but to really make sure that our cloud, because we have those clouds, can provide the same uh, features and services at the same cost of, of those that are placed in the US. That's a really good point. Thank you for that. So do, do some research, guys, on your on your <laughs> on your service providers. And um, we are running uh, short on time. We've got, I've been told we can have an extra couple of minutes, um, which is great. So um, I think we'll just go through each of you just one more time and just say, you know, in a really short twenty seconds. Uh, what would be your, I think, I think I could probably already guess what the answers are going to be, but what would be your kind of number one piece of advice um, for those who are wanting to build the trust and collaboration within their own ecosystems? So I'm going to go to you, Julia, you're top of my screen. Uh, I would say education, really education. Otherwise, either people, like, otherwise people don't understand it. And if you lose people, you lose basically their trust already in, in, in introducing them to the technology. So there's no way that you can build trust in the community if they don't trust the technology, which is the means to do that. So to me, it's education. Brilliant, thank you, love that. Uh, Marius? Okay, um, I would say constructive arguing, put people with different ideas in the same room, let them argue without hurting themselves. And I think you'll get good ideas. Love that. I'm, all, I'm, all, I'm up for an argument any day. <laughs> um, we'll go to CISO next. Sure, I'd say uh, co-creation uh, to uh, give all actors uh, the ability to engage. Uh, whether we're speaking about ethical aspects, as Henry mentioned, or cybersecurity, as Julia referred to, we need to ensure uh, we're following a model that works uh, for all the actors and that all of them have the right incentives to promote three things. Uh, their engagement in the process, the appropriation of the results and the commitment to the implementation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Pumza? I think I probably will echo the same sentiments of my panel. It's encouraging to see that across the world we're talking more inclusion and uh, the fostering of, of you know, uh, inclusion of communities. And I'll tell you, there's a, there's a project that has worked phenomenally, which is based in South Africa, where we, we've looked at the public sector, but working and engaging with the communities 
for the last mile of, of the connectivity. It's working amazingly. The adoption, you know, the support that we get is amazing. Thank you. Brilliant, thank you. And last but not least, uh, Henry. Uh, I will echo all of those and I will finish by saying we must be brave and we must be courageous with having these very tricky conversations. They can be very challenging and they can be just, just challenging for ourselves personally, especially when we have to uh, try and understand our own values. But then, of course, you know, collaborate with the whole world as we do now through technology and with technology. So um, yeah, we, we've just got to remain brave and courageous in the way we, um, we treat one another and, and uh, yeah, be kind as well. Oh, positive, wonderful note to finish on. Thank you very much. Um, so yeah, thank you all of you once again for your time. Um, and so everybody that's watching, thank you for, for, for joining in and get involved in the conversation, your local ecosystems. Um, and just, you know, let's keep plodding along. Um, so I wish everybody a wonderful day or week ahead if your day's already finished. <laughs> um, and yes, enjoy the rest of the conference this week.